about a thousand ethnic Rohingyas called this slice of Southeast Portland home. Many are survivors of genocide in Myanmar, mass atrocities that have been documented by global media. The world's fastest growing humanitarian crisis. A textbook example of ethnic cleansing. Out from our home and then slit my father's throat. Across the river, there's a deliberate campaign of terror going. From the killing fields to urban America, these Rohingya do what they can to move on. But for survivors like Muhammad Noim, everyday life is a reminder of the massacred dead. Inside homes, schools, and strip malls, Portland's Rohingya are taking small steps to overcome their past lives, lives completely devoid of basic human rights. <laughs> Iman Hussein was forced to leave behind everything and everyone he knew, over 8,000 miles away. He, like other Rohingya, were prisoners in their own home. A strip of land in northwest Myanmar called Rakhine State, also known as Arakan. The Rohingya have lived here for centuries, and face ethnic and religious persecution since antiquity, inhabiting what is fundamentally a cultural fault line, where Muslim South Asia and Buddhist Southeast Asia have historically collided. The crisis accelerated in 1962, when an ultra-nationalist military dictatorship took control of Myanmar. This regime passed a law that took Rohingya off Myanmar's list of recognized national ethnicities. This made them a stateless people, with no right to vote, education, or health care. Checkpoints mark the entrance to Ong Mingala. This is Myanmar's version of apartheid. Despite restricted access to Rakhine State, journalists and humanitarian workers have been able to document the plight of the Rohingya. Myanmar's security forces impose restrictions on travel, marriage, and religious worship. They conducted arbitrary arrests, brutal acts of violence, and systematic mass killings. Like in 2017, at least 10,000 were killed, and many more traumatized. One witness to the aftermath of this carnage was Oregon Senator Jeff Merkley. He was the first member of U.S. Congress to lead a delegation to Rakhine State following the 2017 mass killings. People were shot from helicopters. Villages were torched. Women were raped. It, it was horrific, horrific genocide. And for America to be silent is completely unacceptable. As a result of the oppression and the violence, over a million Rohingya have fled to refugee camps in neighboring Bangladesh and tens of thousands to Southeast Asian countries like Malaysia and Indonesia. But a small percentage of Rohingya refugees have also been legally resettled in the U.S. Which brings us back to the quiet drama in places like Portland's Mingala Market. Iman Hussein arrived in Portland as a refugee in early 2018. And within months, he's working at one of the oldest halal markets in town. Yusuf Iqbal is Mingala's owner and the guy responsible for Iman's job. He's also Rohingya, but his life circumstances shaped a very different path to the U.S. I was born and raised in different part of Burma. So because of that, I'm fortunate and my brother and sister we got a chance to go to education as like other Burmese do. Yusuf obtained U.S. citizenship through the diversity visa lottery. Now a business owner, Yusuf's paying it forward by showing the ropes to recently arrived refugees like Iman. He's very happy and he is a quick learner. In the beginning though, it's very difficult. He is illiterate, he doesn't know reads and writes. The most difficult part of his tra training was the to use the scale. It took him about a month. A lot of families frequent Mingala. It's a hub for Southeast Portland's immigrant communities. Iman wanted to show his family, his wife, Hamida, his two children, Kaya's Bibi 
and Rusman Bibi, all still trapped in Rakhine state. Tara bishi dukut. Khai nevar lo nevar er. Ei zal mai tegile zal zal bai nevar er. The gom lagu din le ne aatu ko ek zon aatu ko lagu le nevar aatu ko lagu de. Desham baade maabu ne naasa din tara bishi dukut. Tara bishi hoshtar. And that situation can feel omnipresent because of the internet. This is what genocide looks like. This is genocide in the age of digital news and social media. Everything is online. The hate speech and incitement to kill, to the harrowing mass exodus. So though Portland's Rohingya are thousands of miles away from the horror, they can't actually escape it. I spent my life with the computer, mine and eyes and ears, all are in Bangladesh refugee camps and also in Arkan, Burma. Mohammed's community suffered from devastating attacks in 2016 and 2017. Today, those massacres are a quick Google search away for him. Just typing in his village name, Miothuji, pulls up this one grisly article, among many. All my village was already burned down, and everything they bulldozed. Nothing left. All done, nothing. So the trauma, and then the re-trauma, it's inescapable. But despite the pain, Portland's Rohingya community are figuring out collective ways of healing. I start feeling that I can speak English, and my people do not. I can read and write, and I can help them out in a way that uh, some other people c couldn't do. Yusuf has organized a weekly gathering at the local mosque to share prayers and to consult on pressing information from back home. Someone bring the fresh news, my uncle got shot dead. My nephew was kidnapped. I don't know what's happened. And Yusuf has taken community action a step further. Here he is at a 2018 Portland event. If you knew about Rohingya, raise your hand. Very few. Along with Muhammad Husson Ali, he founded Americans for Rohingya, a nonprofit set up to raise awareness of the Rohingya genocide and advocate for more action. The U.S. slapped economic sanctions on Myanmar in 2018, but has avoided calling what's happening in Rakhine State a genocide. This makes prosecuting Myanmar's military leaders very difficult and prevent safe repatriation of Rohingya refugees. Part of the issue is the region's geopolitics. Burma has a very strong relationship with China. It would take a lot of American leadership to bring China and other Southeast Asian countries and others who trade with Burma to bring enough pressure to create the space for repatriation. So uh, I'm sorry to say this, but I think we're going to have to look to the next administration to show leadership. Meanwhile, Portland's Rohingya community is desperate for resolutions. Returning to Myanmar isn't an option for Rohingya who fled. So, the future of the Rohingya rests with its young living across a new global diaspora. Noyim's doing something he never could have done at home, taking steps towards completing higher education. He'd been beaten and imprisoned as a youth, and in 2015, after his parents managed to secure a spot for him on a trafficker's boat, he nearly drowned at sea en route to Indonesia. But Noyim stayed alive, fulfilling the hopes of his family. Uh, is Burma is, um, is an Asian country. A 2017 UN report found that Myanmar's military singled out educated Rohingya in their violence in an effort to kill Rohingya culture. G-Y-A. Yeah, that's my language. That's my primary language. But with enough people like Noyim pursuing education, that culture might just survive for future generations. As it stands, the majority of the global Rohingya population now live outside their homeland. 
And it's in places like this small mosque in southeast Portland where hope is taking hold. And the story of a long oppressed people begins a new chapter. <laughs>